My stream is working. We are ready to go. All right, everybody. Uh, we're excited here to welcome Tim Detmers to, to our ML Ops learning group today. So Tim's done some amazing work in the quantization space, allowing you to both run training and inference with lower resources on GPUs. He's a PhD student uh, at the University of Washington and the maintainer of Bits and Byte. Um, I first heard of Tim's work with his int8 quantization uh, paper that, that came out, I think in 2012, but uh, he's continued to put out some really groundbreaking research and we're continuing to see the, the frontier of quantization get pushed lower and lower. Um, before we were joking about when do we get to one bit quantization because we're already at three. So maybe that's a, a bucket list item for Tim for 2024, but uh, won't put too much pressure on him. Uh, maybe Tim, hand it over to you. You can talk a little bit more of an intro about yourself if I, if I missed anything and otherwise we'll dive into, into the call, to the presentation. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. Yeah, uh, a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Washington and uh, my advisor is Luke Settlemeyer, um, who's a great advisor. And I work on efficient deep learning in particular making um, uh, large language models more accessible. And so there are different things about large language models. You can train them, you can fine tune them, you can um, um, use them um, with inference, generate uh, new tokens. And um, if you look at the main bottleneck that sort of prevents accessibility of these large models, um, it, for both inference and fine tuning, it's mostly the memory footprint. So usually fine tune on relatively a uh, few data points. And if you inference, you don't wanna um, generate billions of tokens. You just wanna have a little chat or so. And so um, it doesn't require as much compute, but it requires lots of memory. And so um, for me, uh, one big philosophy is that when I look at progress over time in technology, the more accessible technology is, the more people can tinker with it, the more people can um, figure things out as they go, and then they can improve the technology. So my work, I really want to make um, large language models more accessible. And um, I did this uh, in several ways in, in my work. Um, I will not talk about SPQR, but that is sort of a method for inference that's very efficient. Um, but this talk will be about QLORA, uh, which is for um, efficient fine tuning. And so we see for LAMA models, the largest LAMA models, we have a footprint of 780 gigabytes. And with QLORA, you can reduce it to 44 gigabytes without um, any sort of um, disadvantage in the performance. It replicates 16 bit full fine tuning performance. And so um, with that, you basically have no disadvantage. And so, in this talk, the talk is mostly about QLORA. I will talk a lot about uh, some other papers that give you a little bit more background and that sort of contain very important pointers uh, that also led to the creation of QLORA. Um, in particular, the Capit Infant Scaling Law paper that was a very in-depth study of what matters if you do low-bit quantization. And um, all the insights from that paper basically found themselves in the QLORA paper. And we just optimized based on what we found and that led that to QLORA. And so before I dive into these papers, I give you a little bit of background. And um, so most of my work is on quantization. What is quantization? So in general, quantization is if you have a continuous signal and you want to discretize it. Uh, into buckets. Um, in a computer scientist, often you have a hybrid representation like 32-bit, you want to quantize it to something like 4-bit or 8-bit. And um, how does that work? So here I have a plot of a normal distribution in red, and you can see it as sort of a continuous distribution. And now if we want to do a 4-bit quantization, we only have 16 different values. And you see the blue bins. These bins represent the 16 uh, different values. And in fact, uh, what you see here is a, a four bit integer quantization. And um, so how do we do that? And what we do is we find the range, the minimum maximum range of this normal distribution. And then we slice the normal distribution in uh, 16 slices uh, where each of these bins has equal width. And then we can take the middle value of each bin and quantize all the values contained in the bin to this middle value. And with that, we can reduce the entire uh, distribution of the normal distribution, all the different values, just to 16 different values. 
And with that, we get a four-bit integer quantization or four-bit linear quantization. Um, but there are many other quantizations. So uh, one main part of my work is that I try to develop new data types. And new data types can have different benefits in different situations. Um, but what is sort of beneficial is to generalize what a data type is. And here I give you a part of an info data type and a floating point four bit data type. And we see they have different values, they have different ranges. And so to generalize data types, and what I do is I, general, uh, I normalize it into the same range. Here I use the range minus one, one. You can use a different range, but that's just how I define it. And so now we can have basically a mapping from integers to a floating point value and represent any data type of that. Um, if we want to quantize a value with sort of this map from integers to values, um, what we do is um, a two-step process. We normalize the input tensor into the range of the data type, which is minus one, one. And then we find the closest value in our quantization map. Um, usually this is done with binary search, which is a little bit slow, but it's a very general method. And so we can do very general quantizations. Um, just to give you an example to make, make this clear how we apply quantization and how general it is. So here I have a two bit quantization, which is very non standard. We have a single negative value, minus one, and then we have three positive values and we have the input tensor 10 minus three, five, four. And so um, if we want to quantize this input tensor to the two-bit data type, uh, we need to do uh, three steps and for dequantization, a fourth step. Um, so the first step is to normalize the input uh, tensor into the range minus one, one. We do that by dividing by the absolute maximum value of the entire tensor. And the absolute maximum value is 10. So we divide by 10. And that gives us one minus uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And then we do the binary search to find the closest value in the value map. And then we get 1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now we have the values. We can map it back to the index in the data type. And that's 3, 1, 2, 2. And this is what we store. This is basically the information that represents the entire data type. If we want to dequantize um, this stored representation, we do a lookup. So we look up the indices and the associated values, and then we need to undo the normalization. So we multiply by the absolute maximum value, which was 10. And then we get 10, 3, 5, 5. Um, from this quantization, if you compare the final output and the input, we see that we have one large quantization error. The minus 3 turned into a 3. And so this shows that this particular data type is not very good at quantizing the input tensor, that highlights sort of one, one way to think about quantization or quantization data types. And for a particular problem, you can design data types that are really good. And if you use sort of default data types, they might be really bad for your problem. And uh, so this is a data type that I developed and is really good at approximating very tiny magnitude numbers or very large magnitude numbers. And um, this proved particularly useful for 8-bit optimizers. If you have an atom optimizer, the atom optimizer is defined by a ratio of optimizer states. And these ratios are initialized with zero. And uh, when you divide, you add a small constant, so you don't divide by zero. But um, with this ratio, you can have extreme differences. If you have a very large number and you divide by a very small number, then you get a very large uh, weight update. Um, if you have a very tiny number, let's say 0 0.005, and now you have a tiny error, 0 0.001, in normal quantization, that's not a big error. But if you have a ratio, the ratio becomes five times bigger. And so it's really important that the relative error for extremes are very sort of precise. And the dynamic exponent quantization does exactly that. So it's a very good data type for this particular problem. Um, just to go through how this data type is designed, that gives you sort of a little bit of intuition how much freedom you have to design a data type. So we have eight bits. That's an 8-bit data type. One bit is reserved for the sign, minus or plus. And then the first zero bits in the data type from left to right represent an exponent to the uh, 
uh, 10 to the power of 10 uh, minus uh, uh, the number of zero uh, bits. Then the first bit that is a one is an indicator bit. And this doesn't do anything else than indicating that all the remaining bits are for the fraction. And the fraction is normalized into the range uh, zero to one. And um, so we multiply the exponent times this fraction to get the final number. And with this uh, representation, we get a dynamic exponent. So we don't have to choose how many bits we allocate for the exponent, like in the floating point data type. Instead, we can slide the indicator bit left to right to determine how many uh, values you want to use for the exponent. And so that gives you good precision for the extremes, very small, very large number. But it, this is not good for intermediate numbers. And so this data type is actually not that good if you want to do, for example, inference. Uh, just use the language model. It's good for 8-bit optimizers, for example. Um, but this is an example of how you can des design data types and how to think about data types. They are good in certain ranges, they're bad in certain other ranges. You want to uh, maximize the position for your use case. Um, so this was a data types. Another important thing is outliers. Whenever you read quantization uh, papers in deep learning, and uh, what you find is outliers are um, very important in most papers. And just to visualize what outliers do is here I have, again, the same normal distribution and a four-bit quantization. And we have an outlier here at minus 10. And what this does is um, we have one bin allocated for minus 10. And then we have bins of equal width from minus 10 to, min uh, to four. But now all the bins between minus 10 and minus 3, they are completely empty. And that means that uh, basically we have, uh, we go from 16 bins that contain values in 4-bit quantization without an outlier to now 3-bit quantization, which has 8 bins. So if you have an outlier, you might lose uh, basically a bit of precision in your data type. And so as you can imagine, if you do it for the entire tensor, that can cause large errors and your neural network might uh, yield very poor performance, it generates gibberish, or it just doesn't work. And um, an important fix for this problem is very simple. Instead of quantizing the entire tensor with the outlier, is we have shrunk the entire tensor into small blocks and each block is quantized independently. So um, if you look at the top left, quantization, that would be a block with an outlier. And this block might have lower precision, like a three-bit precision equivalent, even though you use a four-bit data type. But all the other quantizations are fine because you don't have outliers. And so the overall sort of efficiency, bit efficiency that you get would be four-bit for all blocks except the first block, which is close to a three-bit quantization. And so um, your overall efficiency improves considerably if you use uh, blocks. And with that, you can confine these outliers. In many engineering disciplines, you can just cut off the outliers and just throw them away and just ignore them. But this is not possible in deep learning. Deep, in deep learning, outliers are usually one of the most important values. So if you remove them, performance drops a lot. Your quantization is stable, but you lose performance. And so your model is pretty, pretty bad. And so um, this is blockwise quantization, a very important concept. And so now you are equipped with sort of basic concepts. And now we uh, um, do a little bit more complicated things. This is uh, k-bit inference scaling laws from the k-bit inference scaling laws paper. And this um, asks questions, what is better? If I have a model with fewer bits per parameter and more parameters, or if I have uh, more bits but fewer parameters? And you can control um, both of these variables and have always the same uh, memory footprint. Um, and for example, a 10 billion model in four bit is the same as a five billion model in eight bit. And so which of these is better? And so with k-bit inference scaling laws, I studied this and to the plot what it shows on the x-axis is how large is the model in just total bits? And so it might, might either be that we have lots of parameters with low precision or fewer parameters with a high precision. On the y-axis, we have mean zero shock accuracy. So we give the model uh, language model a couple of prompts. 
we see what accuracy do they get in answering these prompts. Um, the plot is for OPT models. That means from 125 million to 175 billion parameters. And what we see is different positions per parameter. What we see is that if we go from 16 to 8 to 4 bit, the um, total amount of mean zero shot accuracy per bit of information that we get is better and better the fewer bits we use. That means uh, if you want to have the highest performance of a model, you should use four bit and as many parameters as possible. If you look at three bit quantization, it is unstable. You see this jagged line, and that basically means that at certain model scales, the quantization failed, and it can even lead to basically random performance for some of these models. And so three bit quantization doesn't really work. It doesn't really work if you do it naively. There are some ways to get it to work, but they're more complicated. We don't go into those details right now, but from this, you can take away that four-bit quantization is, is really good. And we should probably use four-bit if we strive for maximum efficiency. Um, if we look at k-bit infant scaling loss, you can also look at other variables that improve quantization uh, so that you get the most performance per bit that you use. And one of these variables is block size, as I said before. Um, the smaller the block size, the better the performance for low bit quantizations. Block size doesn't matter if you have five or more bits, but particularly at three bits or four bits, a small block size is really important. So it means that the tensors chunk just into smaller blocks, so we have more independent quantizations. But one thing to consider is uh, if we have a block that's independently quantized, we'll have an absolute maximum constant for each block. If we have uh, 64 numbers in one block and a 32-bit quantization, absolute maximum quantization constant, that means on average we add 0.45 uh, bits to the quantization. And so in total, if you have uh, a block size of 64, the 4-bit quantization actually turns into a 4.5-bit quantization on average. So this plot shows you basically 4-bit quantizations, but then also things that use a little bit more than 4-bit, but on average, they um, contain, they improve the performance more per single bit of information than other methods. And so small block size are important, but we need to take care of these absolute maximum constants. They grow pretty, pretty quickly in size. Then sort of the last thing, um, the last important takeaway from K-bit inference scaling loss is data types matter. So here um, I sort of introduced a dynamic exponent data type, good for optimizers, but for inference, not so good. Uh, if you look at both integer and dynamic exponent, it gives you less performance per bit. Um, if you look at floating points or quantile quantization, which is an information theoretically optimal data type, these perform much better. And so these are preferred um, to, um, for example, integer data types. And um, that is all the background. Um, I can take a question or two maybe at this point, um, if someone puts in the chat. Um, I see there are already quite, there's some questions here. Um, maybe it's better if we do questions at the end. Uh, let me just continue from here. Um, yes, there are a lot of questions on Slido, so yeah. yeah. Is there a good question that, that makes sense at this point? Uh, I don't have the overview right now. Otherwise, uh, well, uh, we just do them Let's the wait end. till the end. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so let me dive into QLORA. And QLORA has sort of multiple components um, that I will sort of discuss. But the main thing is fine tuning is really expensive. And we've seen a lot of chat models, 7 billion, 13 billion. And the main reason for that is people can't use the large models that are 32 or 65 billion parameters. And here, just a little calculation to sort of help you understand, where does the memory footprint come from? And so if you look at regular full fine tuning, you use 16 bit, uh, a 16 bit model. That means you have a two byte or a 16 bit for the weight, 16 bit or two byte for the gradient. And the optimizer states are usually 32 bit, usually use Atom, which has two optimizer states. That's in total eight byte. So in total, we have 12 byte per parameter for a model. 
This doesn't um, um, take into account the memory needed for um, the activations, um, um, the input gradients. Um, uh, if you use gradient checkpoint, you can reduce that memory, but it's not in this calculation. So just if you look at the memory footprint for parameters and you have a 65 billion model, you multiply by these 12 bytes, you get 780 gigabytes of GPU memory needed to fine tune a 65 billion model. Um, if you have a cheaper data center GPU, say A40s, for example, then that's 17 GPUs. If you have consumer GPUs, it doubles that number to 34 GPUs. So you need 34, 3090, so 1490 GPUs to fine tune a 65 billion model uh, in the usual manner uh, if you have full fine tuning. That's very costly. Very few people can do that. Um, there has been a technique, low rank adapters, where you basically freeze the main model and then you put um, some adapters that learn the fine tuning adjustments um, on top of each layer. And all, each of these adapters are pretty small. So the memory footprint is quite a bit of reduced. So if you go through that footprint, the weights, the frozen weights are still 16 bit. Then the weight gradients for the adapters, optimizer states, and the adapter weights themselves, they're between 0.4 and 0.8 bit. In total, that's 17.6 bits. And that gives you 143 gigabytes of memory for a 65 billion model. So you still need four data center GPUs or eight consumer GPUs. Uh, most people don't have eight consumer GPUs that requires a server motherboard. So um, this helps. You can fine tune if you have a four GPU setup, a 32 billion model, but the 65 billion model are still inaccessible. And so in QLORA, we improve this further. What we do is instead of taking frozen um, a base model, we take a frozen quantized base model and we quantize it to four bit because we know this gives you the maximum efficiency in terms of performance and memory footprint. We still use lower end adapters, but if we now put everything together, we just have 5.2 bits per parameter. And if you do the math, that's 42 gigabytes of memory. So if you have a data center GPU, you can now fine tune on a single GPU, a 65 billion model. If you have consumer GPUs, you just need two GPUs to fine tune this. And now a 32 billion model, you can fine tune on a single GPU. Um, there are other components uh, in sort of uh, QLORA. Um, on the right, you see sort of a schematic of it, full fine tuning, um, and then LORA, and then QLORA. And one part is we have paging optimizers. And um, paging optimizers is another optimization, memory optimization that prevents memory spikes. And um, so if I go back, um, you see the optimizer state is pretty large, 0.8 bits. So if we want to reduce that, uh, we can use page optimizers. With that, we can basically reduce it to zero bit uh, by storing most of the state in, uh, on the CPU. And we just transfer it to the GPU when needed. And so um, that's how page optimizers work. And the nice part is that they are lazy. And they're managed by the GPUs themselves. And so um, there's nothing required. You just say to bits and bytes, hey, I want a page optimizer. And then everything is done. The CPU to GPU, GPU to CPU transfers are automatic. And so what that means is if you request too much memory, you don't get an out of memory error, uh, but instead um, things will be transferred to the CPU and you just continue as normal. So uh, to get uh, go a little bit of details, um, if you have a page optimizer and you have a large mini batch that causes a memory spike, it works like this. So you counter memory spike, you would go out of memory. The engine detects this, then transfers the optimizer state to the CPU. Then you do the normal optimization. And uh, if um, you update now the optimizer state, the engine detects, hey, my state is on the CPU, let's transfer it to the GPU. Then it transfers it to the GPU. You do the normal optimizer step. And if your next mini batch is fit into memory, the optimizer will stay on the GPU. And so it will remain efficient. So only if you have memory spikes, there will be a small sort of uh, fraction of a second where things are a little bit more inefficient because part of the memory is on the CPU. But in fact, you can uh, prevent memory spikes. And that helps a lot because if you have different sequence lengths than your mini batch, you will get spikes. And it's just inevitable. And this helps with that. 
And that's sort of one technique that helps us with the uh, memory sort of footprint. If, if I go back, uh, we have uh, 42 gigabytes if we use Colora on a 65 billion model. But um, you also need a little bit of memory for the activations um, doing backprop. And uh, then things get very tight in a 48 gigabyte GPU. So it's really important that we shave off as many bits as possible. And one way to do this is double quantization, which is a bit silly idea, but it's basically we do a quantization of the quantization and it works perfectly. And so um, to go into the details, we have to wait to 16 bit, we quantize it to four bit, and we have a block size of 64, which means the absolute maximum constants use 0.5 bits on average. And now what we do is we take the absolute maximum constant and we just quantize them again. And so now we have the quantized absolute maximum constants, and then the absolute maximum constants for the absolute maximum constants, and they're very tiny. And so with this, we can basically shave off 0.4 bits, which is as large as all adapters on the model. And so this um, adds not quite a bit of certain memory efficiency. And then the last part, which is maybe the most confusing part, is we develop a new data type. This is an information theoretically data type, information theoretically optimal for normal distributions. That's why we call it normal float, forward normal float, or NF4 for short. And uh, so people were confused. And so uh, Nora Altriri uh, got in touch with me to understand it. And he produced actually this um, chart, this image, uh, where it is explained. And so previously, when, I, when we looked at the in four quantization of a normal distribution, we sliced the bits with equal width. What we now do here in the information theoretically uh, optimal quantization is each slice should have equal area. And so that means it has equal probability mass. And so we want to slice each bit so um, the probability mass increments are the same. This is the first step. Then we find the quantile equivalent, which is basically the equivalent of the middle value of this quantization bin. And that gives us the raw data type. Now we add a zero. A zero is important if you want to, for example, quantize an embedding, uh, padding. If you pad um, your inputs with zeros, not so common in uh, NLP, more common in computer vision, but if you do some padding, you want the padding to have a zero error, otherwise it can cause problems. So that's why this data type has an added zero. And then we normalize it as before into the range minus one, one, and then we get the normal float data type. And this data type um, yields pretty strong performance. Um, so if we move forward to results, um, the first key part is, uh, when uh, I sort of foreshadowed a little bit what we're working on, people were always like, wait, you work on LoRa? LoRa is not good. It doesn't give you good performance. And um, a lot of people are very suspicious about LoRa. They like full fine tuning because it gives you better performance. And so we find actually they were right. Um, if you use the default hyperparameters of LoRa, it doesn't work well. And so what this chart shows is a Rouge L performance which is a measure of how well you replicate basically the, um, the labels and the end generations. It's often used, for example, for summarization, see how close your summarization to a summarization that is a gold label summarization. And um, so we take the central opaca repository, uh, run some benchmarks, found that the performance is not great. Then we optimize learning rate, batch sizes, and so forth. We get a very strong 16-bit baseline. And now what we do is we compare um, hyperparameters. We try all kinds of hyperparameters for LoRa, or actually QLoRa. What we find is there's only one hyperparameter that really matters. This hyperparameter is where do you use um, LoRa on which layers? And we find that the standard, the standard is just use it on the attention modules or on the query and the value projection. And if you do that, performance is lower than 16-bit. It doesn't replicate 16-bit full fine-tuning performance. If we use it on a feed forward network in the transformer, performance improves, but it's still not 16-bit. But if we use it on all layers, then we replicate the full 16-bit performance. And so this is a really important insight. Um, 
the actual size of the adapters doesn't matter. So if you just use things on the attention, make the adapters really big, performance is still bad. So it's important to do it on all layers, but then the size of the adapters actually doesn't matter that much. So you can use relatively small adapters, but it's important that you have it in all the layers. And that's the main insight. So that insight, um, we um, are looking at sort of uh, the performance of our other additions. And so we developed the normal float uh, for bit data type. And then the question is, is it better? And again, here we have these k-bit infant scaling law charts with the model footprint in the x-axis, mean zero shot performed in the y-axis, and we compare uh, a normal four-bit float with a four-bit normal float and a four-bit normal float with double quantization, dq. And so what we find is um, normal floats are much better. And on the right, we compare perplexity, and there we see the gap between integer to float. Uh, float is usually better than integer. Is almost as large as going from float to normal float, which means normal float is uh, quite a bit of improvement in terms of quantization precision. So um, it's a very strong data type. And we verify that again, um, if we do instruction tuning of LAMA models, and this, this table has a lot of numbers, the important bit is just the last column, the mean of all the model sizes and two different data sets, PACA and FLAN2. And then at the first column, we have the data type, the normal uh, brain float 16 data type, four-bit float data type, and then the normal float data type. And so if we look at the mean, we find that um, to replicate 16-bit performance, it's important that we use the normal float data type. If we have the normal four-bit uh, data type, we don't replicate the performance um, of the 16-bit um, baseline. And so normal floats are important to really get good performance for quantized uh, low rank adapter models. And with that, uh, we basically showed that, hey, we can replicate full fine tuning, 16 bit, but we only use four bit, And so it's 17 times more memory efficient. And so with that, we can run so many experiments also on very large models, which was previously impossible. And totally we run uh, more than a thousand experiments to really figure out what hyperparameters matter, what data sets are important or work well. And we compare different benchmarks. One benchmark, common instruction fine tuning benchmark is MMOU, uh, where you have sort of a five short context. And it's mostly about reasoning and education, like high school knowledge, college knowledge. And um, there's a little bit of sort of lawyer stuff and some sort of common sense knowledge. And if you look at the performance, some data sets do much better than others. We see FLAN v2. And so these numbers are accuracy numbers. So accuracy on this benchmark. And we see FLAN v2 for the small models is much better than other data sets. And um, for the 65 billion model, it's the only data set that actually improves the baseline performance. So if you instruct, if you fine tune on instruction data sets, um, and for the 65 billion model, performance actually gets worse. So um, the base model is already pretty good at sort of following instructions, at least for the state set. Um, as we see later, this is a little bit um, misleading, this benchmark. If you just look at chatbot performance, Flan v2 is actually the worst data set among these. And the best data set um, is the open assistant data set. And we use it to build the Guanaco model and this this has by far the best performance. So you see from this benchmark already that um, certain fine tuning data sets are good for certain tasks, but not good for in general. If you want to have a good model, you always need to use fine tuning data that is good for your task that you care about. That's one main takeaway. So um, the final slides are a little bit about chatbot evaluation and our chatbot performance. We create this clinical model which gets a uh, very high performance. And um, so a little bit more talk about evaluation. Evaluation is very difficult. A lot of people work on evaluation. Uh, one reason why it's so uh, difficult is it's because it's so open-ended. If you have the prompt, what are 10 tips that make me more productive? And then you can ask different language models, they produce different lists. Language models are in general quite good right now. So you get probably some, pretty reasonable sort of response for this. 
But then the question is, which prompt is better? Are there maybe some tips that are better than others? Or is the format like important? Like um, a list of 10 bullet points is easier to read, but it might uh, not contain as much information as a dense text where you can sort of relate different tips to each other. And maybe the first tips are much more important and um, you can have an argument about uh, sort of overall productivity. And um, the question is, yeah, which response is better? If we ask humans, uh, they give very noisy answers. It's it's just subjective. Um, some people like bullet point lists, some do not. Um, and some people really like, for example, some tips in this prompt, and they say like, oh yeah, this is a very good tip, I like this response. And so if you aggregate everything, it's very noisy. It's very difficult to say which model is better than which other model because the variations are so noisy with humans. What you can do instead is use GPT-4 instead of humans. GPT-4 is more reliable because it has a fixed bias. And the bias is bad and it's important that you um, sort of uncover the bias so you can prevent um, false results. For example, if you give GPT-4 two, two um, responses for a prompt, it will always give the first uh, a response a higher score. Uh, so if you say like which of these responses is better and what what kind of score would you give and um, the responses, GPT-4 likes the first response. So to control for that, you need to have both conditions where you have both orders of the prompt, and then you compare both scores and average them. And um, that's for example one thing. Another thing, if you compare GPT-4 with itself, it always likes itself a lot. If you uh, look at humans, humans say GPT-4 is really good, but not as good as GPT-4 says itself is. And so there's also bias there. Some chat models will like some other chat models um, more for no particular reason. It's just to have a certain bias. And so it's important to think about that. Um, the, the last sort of thing is we try different ways of um, benchmarking. Um, if you say like, here's a prompt, Here's a response. How good is the response? GPT-4 is actually pretty bad at that. And so there it's similar to humans that um, if you don't have a reference of what is good, um, it's very difficult to say if a response is good or not. If you compare two responses, it's much easier to say which one is better than another one. And humans are noisy, but a GPT-4 is relatively robust. And so that's in the end the setup that we use. So you have the prompt. You have different chatbot models giving a response, and then GPT-4 judges which response is better than the other. And so with this, you can get a ranking of which chat model, chatbot model is better. And um, then it leads to statements like, um, we develop a model that has 97% chat GPT performance on the Vicuña benchmark. And this uh, statement is correct. It's correct for this benchmark. But the big problem right now is our benchmarks are not good enough to really give you a signal for a broad uh, chatbot performance. So if you uh, read statements like these, you have to think for this data set, they're as good, but not in general. It doesn't mean in general. Uh, ChatGPT is really good sort of at factual knowledge creation, much better than other data sets, and math, and also a little bit of reasoning. And it's difficult to design benchmarks that reflect this. But yeah, with everything um, that I just said, Here's some numbers. On the left, we have a table of sort of relative performance to ChatGPT, which means we always do a paired comparison between ChatGPT and the target model. And GPT-4 gives us basically, says basically, hey, this, this response is better, the other response is better. And so what we see that the Guanaco model that we designed on the open uh, assistant data set, we designed it on the open assistant data set where we <clears throat> filter out all the sort of mediocre responses. We only take the best of the best. And this gives you very strong performance. Um, we also see the Flan V2 model is always the worst. So it's just not good chatbot data. And um, it's good for other things like MMRU, but not if you want to create a chatbot. Um, if you look at the table, the last column has a 95% confidence interval. So there's a lot of uncertainty of how good um, a model is compared to ChatGPT. And so when we saw this, actually so many things overlap and you can't actually determine the ranking, which is better than another. So a better version of this is on the right. And so instead of comparing 
a model against ChatGPT, we compare a model against all other models. So this is a, a, a tournament basically, where each model competes against each other model, GPT-4 is a judge, and each game you gain ELO points or you, or you lose at ELO points based on you win, how, if you win or lose, and um, based on how strong your opponent was. So if your opponent is really strong, uh, so if your opponent has a really high ELO rating and you win, you gain much more points than if you win against a weak opponent. And so if you look at that ranking, it's a bit more reliable. The confidence interval is very small. It's actually a little bit less than one ELO point. So these are very reliable rankings for the Vicuña data set. That's important to say. It's, this is just for the Vicuña data sets, which is 80 prompts. It's not in general. But on this data set, um, the Guanaco model uh, outperforms ChatGPT. And so by quite a bit. And uh, sort of we have similar rankings. Um, uh, LLM says they run sort of the open competition that is continuous, and there they compare, uh, compare Shepard models. And uh, Guanaco does really well. And uh, the other sort of important thing is Guanaco is a quantized model. It's much smaller than other models of the same size. If I go back to the other sort of table, we see that a 33 billion Guanaco model is actually smaller than a 13 billion Vicuña model. So we get very strong performance with a very small memory footprint. And um, they unfortunately didn't evaluate the Guanaco 65 billion model, but um, it's probably one of the best models out there right now, just because uh, for a certain memory footprint, you just have more parameters. That gives you better performance, similar to what we showed in the Cambridge infant scanning loss. And yeah, that is sort of everything that I have. So here I presented uh, QLORA, and we can use uh, a new data type, double quantization and page optimizers to get both a very small memory footprint, but also replicate a 16-bit fine, full fine tuning for performance. And so that makes things much more accessible uh, without any drawbacks. And um, in the next days, I will also release four bit inference kernels with batch size one, and these will be very fast. So um, I benchmarked them on 3090s and 4090s. And they reached 95% of theoretical uh, performance, which basically means um, these will be 3.5 faster than um, 16 bit inference. And so uh, with that, you should also have very fast inference for these models. So you can fine tune them very easily, you can inference them very easily. And overall, that makes it much more accessible and, um, yeah, easy to use. And that's everything that I have. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I'm happy to take questions now. All right. Amazing, Tim. Thank you for walking us through that. Um, so I'm just going to grab some questions from the Slido. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody, if you want to go into the Slido and just double check if there are any questions that you want answered, because we do have 26. I don't know if we can go through all of them. Um, let's, let's start off with the first one. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked, what tooling do you recommend to use quantized models and evaluate quantization? So, I mean, there are different tools and there's sort of some common tools that have very nice pipelines, um, where you go directly from model to, uh, basically a chat interface. And so that's very easy to use for, for common users. Um, there's like uh, CCP, uh, CPP Llama and that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember the names of sort of other frameworks. There are a couple of frameworks that it's sort of easy to use. But um, the problem with these frameworks is that they often use pre-quantized rates. So you only have certain models that are supported and um, things can be a bit slow. Um, in bits and bytes, now everything, all the sort of models are uh, supported. So if you have a hugging face and new model is released, you can immediately use it for bits and, uh, with bits and bytes. Um, you just need to use a load and four bit uh, parameter in the um, <clears throat> uh, when loading the model from the pre trained um, uh, string. <clears throat> And uh, now also with the fast uh, four-bit quantization, it's actually um, basically theoretically optimal. So if you want a fast quantization just for a chatbot interface, a person chat interface, um, hugging face will be very, very optimal. Um, another thing that is sort of not out there yet is um, um, that um, what you can do with QLORA and bits and bytes is you have a base model, let's say Llama or Falcon, 
Now you have different specialized models. For example, you have a model that is good for code generation. You have a model that's good for code debugging. You have a model that is good at translating an issue into code. And these are three different models specialized for certain, certain tasks. And now with QLaura, you can just swap out um, these different models by just swapping out the adapters. And so in other frameworks, this is not supported. This is the advantage of bits and bytes. It's just a bit more general. Model GPUs are supported um, and you can use all models. Yeah. So I guess that's a comparison against different frameworks and how bits and bytes um, uh, stands compared to these. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'm just in the coffee shop here. But so <laughs> we talked a little bit about chat and QR for chat. Somebody asked about mm -hmm. other fine tuning or pre training for, for QLaura. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, or can you even use QLaura for that? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get, get the question. So, there are different pre trainings for QLaura? I mean, like a second so, pre training? So, oh, uh, the, the question is that you talk about chat, chat evaluation for uh, QLaura and using QLaura for that. Somebody's asking about use cases, other use cases. They want to yeah. fine tune on a textbook, something else. Can you still yeah. use QLaura for that? Yeah, so so um, it should it should be possible. We have also some uh, sort of uh, experiments for different use cases um, where we don't do instruction tuning. We just do a normal sort of glue fine tuning, just a different NLP data sets, and the and the the uh, results are basically the same. And so that's an indicator that it probably works for all other things. Um, people tried it um, also for reinforcement learning, which is similar to instruction fine tuning. But um, from what I've heard from the community, it is possible to fine tune. Um, the current code base uh, doesn't have flash attention because it doesn't it isn't that useful for instruction fine tuning because the context length is usually pretty small. But if you want to, for example, fine tune in textbooks, this is uh, something that you need to add or we might add soon sort of to the repository. But otherwise, there should be no issues with it. You can fine tune on very different data sources, all kinds of different things, probably also different modalities if you want to train a multimodal model uh, with QLaura, that should also be possible. So yeah, uh, it should be possible. Um, one more question here. So you talked about calculating some of those quantization states. Uh, one of the questions is, what's the complexity? I'm assuming computational complexity for doing those calculations for the, for the different layers. Um, yeah, and, and that's about the quantization calculations, right? Yep. So if I maybe, uh, let's, let me see. So the process is basically this. And so there are two parts, the quantization and the dequantization. And if I look at the quantization, particularly on the GPU, what is really expensive is a binary search. So usually if you have a binary search, it's very efficient just to go through a small array. But if you have the GPU, you have lots of threads accessing the same array. And this causes conflicts where multiple threads are serialized. So they queue after each other. And that, that is slow. So basically here, the third part is pretty slow. Um, I tried a lot, lot of different things to sort of improve it, but it's also mostly slow for 8-bit. If you go down to 5-bit, uh, uh, starting about 5 to 6-bit, things actually become very efficient, uh, almost sort of theoretically maximum. So uh, with that, so if you go to 6 bits or lower, um, the finding of the associate index is very fast because you can avoid these conflicts with certain data structures. And then also the fourth part, the dequantization. So in QLaura, we quantize once, then we have the weights, and then we just dequantize it um, to the computation data type, reuse it always. So we no longer need to quantize. The dequantization step is very optimal. Um, it's, it's easy to optimize. And I wasn't quite sure if it was optimal for all data types. It's easy to do for integers and easy to do for floating point eights if that is supported. I was unsure if it was uh, going well for a normal float four, but um, as I said before, I implemented the inference kernels. They are theoretically, close to theoretically optimal. So um, that is also not a problem. So um, the main bottleneck is higher bit quantization, finding the associated index in the binary search. That's the main bottleneck. Related to that, somebody else asked about optimal hardware. So doing a binary search on GPUs is 
expensive. How yeah. about other hardware? Is it a GPU limitation? Are CPUs better? What about other architectures? I know there's some companies out there developing their own chips. We've seen some yeah. uh, FPGAs. We've seen TPUs. Sort of, and any any remarks on that? Yeah. So. Um... If you have something like CPUs, the problem is uh, much less severe because you have much lower latency uh, for sort of small pieces of memory. So GPUs are very good at memory throughput, but not so good at latency. And so CPUs are much better for that. Um, but you still have problems. I mean, we are in a regime where often to improve a hardware, you need more cores. And the more cores you have, the more threats you also need to sort of um, service these cores with a high enough memory throughput. And so um, you have similar problems, you will have similar problems in the future, but one way to avoid these would be to have a hardware dedicated, uh, basically binary search and lookup table. And these would be very efficient and these could be implemented in hardware. And um, then all these problems go away. And that, in that world, what we would have is we have a storage type, we have a computation data type, and conversion between these two is just um, super efficient. Um, and it's just as efficient as a normal conversion from int to float, for example, or the other way around. And so I think we probably will see this. So there's more steam in these data types in the sense that we will see further improvements. Uh, going to three bits, um, data types will play a big role. And um, so hardware implementations like these, I think they will, we will see them soon, probably in the next couple of years. Um, yeah. Very interesting. I, I know on consumer hardware, phone, phones and computers, people are implementing different chips for different purposes. So it'd be interesting for commercial deep learning hardware to do something similar. Yeah. Um, so maybe I think two more questions. Next question mm -hmm. I had was somebody asked about uh, double quantization. So how is that? Mm -hmm. How does that work? How is it different from regular quantization, maybe with lower precision? So um, the double quantization uh, quantizes again the absolute maximum constants, and so um, the difference between like a single quantization and lower precision is that the quantized main weights they have a lower precision. And so, um, uh, I don't know if I can quickly bring this up, but in our SPQR paper, there is um, a plot of basically a cliff of quantization performance. And things drop down very quickly if you go to um, two-bit uh, quantized weights. And three-bit, there's also a sort of a small drop. So um, I have it right here. So. Um, you see this group. So we have here we have the average bits. This is a, a combination of base bits and the weights and additional bits similar to the absolute maximum constants. And so this is four bit, this group is three bit, and this is two bit base quantization. And so what you see from here is three bits is kind of fine, but two bits is terrible. And even this jump here, you lose a lot of performance. So that means you want to keep the quantized weights and as high precision as possible. That means you can only do double quantization uh, on the remaining constant part. And so that is a trade-off. Um, doing double quantization with the four-bit base weights um, is better than three-bit base weights and no double quantization. Just gives you better performance for each bit that you have. Amazing, Th thanks for explaining that again. Um, just looking through for a final question. Uh, I do, I guess we'll, we'll ask an open-ended question. So mm -hmm. you were working on eight bits before that we had 16 bits. We're doing three to four bits, sort of what's, what are you thinking about, uh, like two, two or one bit models, yes. I guess. We have, if you have more parameters in theory, right, you could do some kind of substitution there, um, maybe some more explainability of what each parameter is doing, right? But yeah. what, what are your thoughts about one or, one or two? Sort of where, where do you see it going? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of things. Um, if we look at one or two bits, uh, historically it worked pretty well for computer vision. But uh, the thing is, if you have transformer models, especially trained on lots of data, they behave a little bit different. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, it's very difficult to quantize transforms to two bits. Um, three bits is kind of okay, but two bits is very difficult. It's very related to this chart that I just showed. This is like language modeling performance and lower is better. And uh, we see these bit, uh, group of two bit quantizations. It's just pretty bad performance. And so usually a, a drop of about 0.1 uh, perplexity is pretty significant. So this, this gap is pretty significant. But this is just totally bad performance. And so we see two bit is really difficult. Three bit, um, there is a gap and we want to close this gap. And so I think we will make very strong progress towards this. And a main progress will be that you use three bit uh, base weights, but you use less absolute maximum constants. You use less sort of outliers. And that means that this group will shift closer to here. So you can imagine that we are closer in average to three bits, but the performance will be about here. And we probably get there in the next couple of months. And then is sort of um, then is sort of the question, what do we do after that? And um, there might be some ideas that help, but it becomes a really difficult problem. Um, I think two bits is really difficult. And it might be that we need to have more outliers, more sparsity, where we have sort of certain blocks in three bits, certain blocks in two bit. And so on average, we are probably then closer to 2.5 bits, but um, I think that will at least probably take a year to get there. Amazing. Well, if we get there in a year, that'll still keep changing the LLM space uh, immensely. We, if, if we ask people in 2018, right, where, where would language models be? Like we, this is a whole area that I'm guessing that people weren't, weren't thinking too much about, but, um, Amazing work. Thank you for, for walking through the, the talk. I mean, you could probably do, do a number of more talks, but, but we'll leave it here. Uh, appreciate all your help, Tim, and everybody for, for your questions. Uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Tim, do you mind sharing the, the slide deck if that's okay with the group? That's okay. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can share it with me and I'll post uh, I'll it in the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me, uh, Dennis. And um, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, some yeah. great questions. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Um, the other thing, as you said, there was sort of 